And good day. I have some uh, really important things to share with you. Important things that could be absolutely life-saving, but first what I'd like to do is review some of the things that we've talked about. The most important goal that people have is to look great, and better yet, to look great and never be hungry. And how did we learn to do that? Well, by choosing foods that are calorie dilute. Remember, the bottom row of stomachs are full of calorie-dense foods, and we move to the top row of stomachs on a healthy diet, which are calorie-dilute foods, so they change the calorie concentration of the foods by fourfold. And the next thing that we learned was the fat you eat is the fat you wear, and you'll always remember that when you choose fats to put in your food. If you want to wear them, you think that's necessary, then just put them on in the food. And the last thing that we learned was that carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive. Now, isn't it interesting that when you put these three principles together, the foods that are calorie dilute are low fat and high carbohydrate? Pretty neat. And the foods that are calorie dense are high fat and low carbohydrate. So you don't have to choose one kind of food or the other. The other thing that you should notice is the foods that are calorie dense, high fat, low carbohydrate, are full of the things that make us sick. They're full of cholesterol, they lack dietary fiber, they're full of animal protein, they're full of contamination from the environment, they have a serious imbalance of vitamins and minerals, whereas the foods that are calorie dilute, your plant foods, your starches, vegetables, and fruits, are low fat, high carbohydrate, they have no cholesterol, they're loaded with dietary fiber, they have a great balance of vitamins and minerals. So when you go to the supermarket, you don't have to walk down the aisle and say, let's see, today I'll pick food that makes me thin, and tomorrow I'll pick food that makes me healthy. You don't have that choice. The same foods that make you fat make you sick, and the same foods that make you thin also make you healthy. Nice way nature designed her systems. Now, one of the ways we look at foods as doctors, dietitians, and dentists is in terms of calories per gram. A gram is one thirtieth of an ounce. And what you see here is that olive oil has nine calories per gram, just like lard. Whereas beef, cheese, and white sugar have four calories per gram. And some of the foods that we're now going to eat, like bread, is 2.4 calories per gram. Beans are 1.2. Rice is 1.2. Potatoes, 0.8 calories per gram. And your other fruits and vegetables, just a few tenths of a calorie per gram. Now, in terms of what we talked about, in terms of the three principles, consider two foods we have strong feelings about. And those foods are health food olive oil and killer white sugar. Well, compare. First of all, you notice that olive oil is two and a quarter times more concentrated in calories than white sugar. Olive oil is 100% fat that you're going to wear. Sugar has no fat to wear. Olive oil has no carbohydrate to shut off the hunger drive, whereas sugar is pure carbohydrate to shut off the hunger drive. So when it comes to choices, you're much better off sprinkling a little bit of sugar over your oatmeal as opposed to dunking your bread in olive oil at dinner time. You might as well just make a little slit right here and dump that olive oil right in because that is where it's going to go. Now, some of the results. I run a 12-day program at St. Helena Hospital. We put over 1,600 people through that program. Unrestricted eating. I tell them, not jokingly, but I tell them, the more you eat, the thinner and healthier you will be. I've got to get people away from the attitude that food's their enemy. And so I do challenge them. I say, now eat. This is an eating program. And so they sit down to delicious buffet-style meals. Three times a day, they can take food back to their room. And they'll often say to me three, four days in the program, I'm eating so much, I I've got to be getting fat. But these are the results. Overweight men lose over five pounds with that kind of eating in 11 days. And overweight women lose about four pounds in 11 days. Now, if you multiply that over a month, you're looking at 8, 10, 12, 16, 20-pound weight losses doing something normal and natural, eating delicious food. You're not doing something superhuman like starving with the pain of hunger. Very few people can do that. You're not doing something strange like taking uh, protein powders and, and pills that have been associated with serious problems or eating really bizarre diets way off the edge of sensibility. You're just eating delicious meals of spaghetti and marinara sauce, bean burritos, oatmeal, vegetable sandwiches, mushu vegetables. I mean, some of my favorite things, that's all you do. And that kind of program, you can live for a lifetime. And you say a lifetime. How long do people maintain this weight loss? This is just 11 days you're showing me. Well, 
I run programs at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota. And we have data that extends to three years. What we find is those people who comply with the program, their average weight loss is 36 pounds over a year. Over one year, they maintain a 36-pound weight loss. And we have people who have lost 70 and 90 pounds, eating as much as they want. Now, you say 36 pounds. That's no big deal. Well, let me show you what 36 pounds is. Well, 5 pounds here, multiply that by 7. And you can imagine not having to carry 7 of these around. Yeah. Or 10 of these around. Yeah, 5 pounds of fat. It's a big deal. Now, there is a registry that more people should know about. It's called the National Weight Control Registry. And what it is, is a, it's a study of people who've maintained a weight loss of over 30 pounds for more than a year. And what they find consistently is those people who are able to maintain that weight loss are those who eat a low-fat, low-energy diet. Almost everybody in the study eats that kind of diet. In other words, a diet very high in plant foods. 80% of the people ate less than 30% fat, and 35% of the people ate less than 20% fat. The kind of diet that Mary and I are teaching you is around 7% fat. So it even makes it easier and more likely that you're going to be associated with these long-term weight losses. The weight losses are up to 38 years. A recent study, as a matter of fact, it took place January 11th of 2001. It was reported by the United States Department of Agriculture. They looked at the scientific research, and they compared all the different diets that are so popular out there, the high-protein diets, the calorie-restricted diets, the whatever type diet there is. They compared them all, and they came to the conclusion that only high-carb diets work for long-term. And that's what the truth is. So what I would suggest to you is that you stop playing around. You get right with it, and you decide that you're going to eat a diet that has caused millions and millions of people on this earth to be trim, young-looking, active, and free of diseases that are common to people in this country. If I just gave you the globe and I said, here, go out and design me a diet. Look at the people around the world. See what they eat. The thing you would immediately notice is those people who live on high-carbohydrate, starch-based diets are trim, young-looking, hearty, and healthy. This is something anybody can figure out. Goal number two. Goal number two is to avoid a heart attack. And that's something that affects an awful lot of people in this country. As a matter of fact, 1.25 million people in the United States have a heart attack every year. And it's a very unforgiving problem. Half the people who have heart attacks, they die of their disease. And you know, half the people who have heart attacks never knew there, there was anything wrong. They thought they were perfectly healthy. Well, it's not just heart attacks we're talking about. We're talking about diseases of lots of arteries in the body. And we name the disease based upon the organ affected. For example, if you close the arteries to the ears, you have hearing loss. You close the arteries to the head, you get a stroke. Close the arteries to the heart, you have a heart attack. Close the arteries to the kidneys, it's kidney failure. The arteries to the back, and you get back pain, and eventually you get degenerative disc disease. Ruptured lumbar discs, they call it degenerative disc disease, that's because the discs degenerate. And then what happens is you twist or turn, and the disc breaks. It's not because you picked up a Volkswagen. The discs are rotten because they haven't gotten adequate circulation. You close the arteries to the legs, and you get pain when you walk. We call that intermittent claudication. Close them down very badly, and the feet die. And we call that gangrene. Now, here's one that you all take note about. You close the arteries to the penis, and you become impotent. For many men, that's worse than a heart attack. Let's talk about the disease, and it's very important you understand it because it'll explain all kinds of things about the problem and the heart attack and things associated with it, including the treatments. I'd like to divide the disease into two processes, and they're, they're, they're common in the sense that they're caused by the same thing, the rich American diet. I'd like to divide the disease into atherosclerosis, which is where the arteries get damaged, and thrombosis, which is the blood clot that occurs that finally closes off the artery. Atherosclerosis. The inside line of the artery has a thin skin. It's called the intima. And that skin is also very smooth, but it can get injured. It gets injured by products of cigarette smoke combustion, gets injured by 
oxidized cholesterol, injured by antibodies that are made against dairy protein that go and attack the inside line of the arteries. Once injured, that skin becomes permeable, and now cholesterol and fat can get under the skin and cause festering sores. Now, we don't call these festering sores because that would scare you, and you might do something about it like change your diet. Instead, we call them plaques. Now, a plaque, that's a rather innocuous thing, and nobody, nobody knows what a plaque is, so you don't have to worry about it. But it's a festering sore is what it is. It's like if you've got a sliver stuck under your skin, you get redness and swelling, and then pus would lay in, and then eventually scar tissue would settle in. But you wouldn't let that happen, no, because it hurts. And so you reach down with the tweezers and pull that sliver out, and the problem would resolve. The difficulty with the arteries is they don't have nerves. And so you get slivers of cholesterol and globs of fat stuck under that skin, causing these festering sores, and you feel nothing until the tragedy hits. And then when the tragedy hits, the pain can be great, like an elephant sitting on your chest. It's important you understand how the tragedy, the final closure, occurs. What happens is a tiny sore, oh, let's call it a plaque, a tiny plaque develops a crack in the surface, and the inner contents come spurting out of this plaque like a pimple ruptured on a teenager's face. Now let me repeat that again. It's a tiny plaque that ruptures. With that rupture of the plaque, the injury that occurs acts as a catalyst to cause the blood to want to clot. Then the blood clots and forms a thrombus. A thrombus is a blood clot. This process is so common in heart attacks that in every hospital in the country you can go in and they will use interchangeably the words heart attack and coronary artery thrombosis. Now, why do you want to know this? Well, it explains to you some very important things about heart disease. For example, it explains why, quote, perfectly healthy people have heart attacks. You go to bed at night, everything's fine. You wake up the next morning, you shake your spouse, and he's not there. Well, he was perfectly fine when I put him to bed. No, he wasn't perfectly fine when you put him to bed. He had all these little sores, these little landmines waiting to burst. The disease that kills causes no symptoms because it's only tiny little plaques. If you understand this mechanism, you know why bypass surgery does not save lives in most cases. It's because bypass surgery bypasses the big plaques, the ones that are scar, scar tissue filled, that are very stable, and so they're very, not very likely to rupture. They cause chest pain because the flow, the circulation is compromised, and so you get chest pain when the heart doesn't get enough blood but they're not going to burst and, and eventually lead to a blood clot. What bursts is the little plaque that may be a half an inch away or in the next artery over. And we do nothing about that when we do bypass surgery. As a matter of fact, we add insult to injury. As a reward for, sur for, sur for surviving bypass surgery, in every hospital I know of, they'll serve you bacon and eggs for breakfast and pork chops for dinner. I mean, here you got this teaching moment, okay? Somebody just sliced your chest open. You're laying there. Doctor, doctor, I don't ever want to have this happen to me again. Never. What do I do? Oh, we don't know what to tell you. Just eat your cheeseburger. If you understand this mechanism, you understand why angioplasty does not save lives and has never been shown to save lives. That's why they take the catheter. They put it up your aorta into your heart. They blow up a balloon, cut with a knife or a laser. The problem here is all that cutting and squashing causes injury, which makes the blood want to clot. And so the Achilles heel of this procedure is that within five months, 40% of the arteries so treated are completely closed down. If you understand this mechanism, you understand how aspirin works. And I do recommend a tiny amount of aspirin, maybe a baby aspirin or less, for people with a strong history of heart disease, like you've had angioplasty, heart attack, bypass surgery, then you're at high risk for another problem. And I recommend a baby aspirin or less for these people. But if you don't have that history, then baby aspirin should not be prescribed for heart disease. What happens is the aspirin thins the blood so that when the plaque ruptures, the clot is much less likely to form. If you understand this mechanism, you understand how vegetable oil works. Vegetable oil thins the blood so the clot is less likely to form. But that's not a safe way to thin the blood. It causes obesity, promotes cancers we'll talk about. You can overthin the blood. The way you want to thin the blood is to take the animal fat out. And when you take the animal fat out, you've removed the strongest clotting factor that human beings come in contact with. 
Animal fat makes the platelets very adhesive. They can hardly wait to stick together. Makes the blood clot clotting proteins get very active. They want to spill over into this clot. As soon as you change your diet, you reduce your risk of dying of a heart attack or a stroke by thinning the blood, and also you make the plaques much more stable. As soon as you change your diet, instead of more fat and cholesterol going into the plaques and them growing and the surface being stretched, more cholesterol and fat come out, and you take the surface tension off the plaque so it's less likely to rupture. And you also bathe the plaque with healthier blood so you stabilize the membrane. So within hours of changing your diet, you've dramatically reduced your risks. Now, does this disease heal? Yes, it does. And we see reversal of atherosclerosis. As a matter of fact, scientific studies show that if you follow a good diet and lifestyle, that 82% of the people will show reversal of artery disease. By drug therapy, cholesterol-lowering drugs, about 16 to 30% will show reversal at the end of a year. So that's to reinforce for you that diet and lifestyle are the foundation to getting well, and we save medications as a secondary approach. This is not cement in your arteries. This is not concrete. This is tissue, and it will heal. And the atherosclerosis will get smaller, and your arteries will stay cleaner, and your organs will continue to function well as they should. Blood cholesterol level is a crystal ball. It predicts what's going to happen to you in the future. Average cholesterol in this country is 210 to 220. That means you're average. That means you have an average chance of having problems that Americans have. That means you have a 50% chance of dying prematurely of a stroke or a heart attack. Average you don't want to be because you're being compared with sick people. You want to be ideal. Ideal is a cholesterol of 150 or less because there are people who say, very respected scientists who say that heart disease does not occur when cholesterol is below 150, that people are immune from heart disease. And I think that's a pretty close statement, a pretty accurate statement. Now, when you raise your cholesterol up to the 260, 280, 300 range, then you're likely to have a problem. You can pretty much predict that you're going to die of a problem like a stroke or a heart attack. I discovered cholesterol when I was 22 years old. I went to see the doctor for another reason. Doctor checked my blood, said to me, John, you know, your cholesterol is a little high, a little high, but still within the normal range. Well, back then, normal was de determined by a bell-shaped curve. And so as long as you didn't end up in the 2% on either side, you were normal. So normal was 150 to 350, and I was normal. I was 335. <clears throat> now, I have a strong family history of heart disease, and as I told you, I had a stroke when I was 18 years old. Now my cholesterol, through dietary change alone, runs 128 to 140. And most of you can get to that same position. But some of you will need cholesterol-lowering medication, and that's the way I treat my patients, is the diet is the foundation, and then we use enough cholesterol-lowering medication to lower the cholesterol below 150. And that's based on judgment, on the best guess possible. You've got to consider what the person's risk is. If they have a strong family history of heart disease, they've had a heart attack, stroke, bypass surgery, other risk factors, then I tend to be more aggressive with medication. If not, if they don't have these factors that would predict a likely occurrence in the near future, then I'm much more conservative when it comes to cholesterol-lowering medication. Now, let's see what you can do with a good diet. This is data from my program at St. Lena Hospital, and this is looking at 1,250 people. When they come in, the average cholesterol is 219. Five days later, we recheck their cholesterol and it's dropped to 204. In other words, a 15-milligram drop in five days or three milligrams per day. And when they leave the program, the average drop is down to 190, or a 29-point drop in cholesterol, simply through dietary change alone. Now, I have told you that my enjoyment in medicine comes from helping people. And the more that I can help somebody, the happier I am. So it only follows that the sicker you are, the happier I am, because the more improvement you will make. You have a greater margin for improvement. And so it is, really. I see people come in with bags full of pills, they're despondent because they've been through every treatment, every procedure. And I tell them, rejoice. You're going to be the star of the program. <laughs> so it is with uh, cholesterol levels. If you take a look at uh, the whole range of cholesterols, you see the average drop is 29 points. If people start with a cholesterol less than 200, then the average drop is 16 points in 11 days. 
Uh, 200 to 250, the average drop is 29 points. Uh, 250 to 300, the average drop is 41 points. And in less time than you take for a summer vacation, if your cholesterol starts at over 300, the average drop is 65 points, simply through dietary change alone. Now, a lot of people say that if you go on a high-carbohydrate diet, you may lower your cholesterol, but you'll raise your triglycerides. But that's not what happens in a free-living, normal, natural situation. In our program, triglycerides drop greatly. The average drop is 10 points. If you start with high triglycerides, say over 600, the average drop is 311 points in 11 days. Now, you can make triglycerides go up on a high-carbohydrate diet. And investigators do do it. I don't know whether they do it always knowingly, but they design the diet in this way. They feed lots of simple sugars. Fruits are really good at raising triglycerides. They feed lots of refined products, and they overfeed their patients. And when you overfeed your patients, you make them eat more than they want to eat, then what happens is you can get the triglycerides to go up. But if you do it in a free living situation like we all eat, the triglycerides go down, as I showed you, and your risk of dying of heart disease dramatically decreases. Now, I do use cholesterol-lowering medications. I start with what I consider the, quote, natural cholesterol-lowering medications because they're simple, they're relatively safe, they're relatively low cost, and they're quite effective. For example, garlic will lower cholesterol 9%. Even deodorized garlic will lower it around 7%. Vitamin C lowers it uh, 5, 10, 15%. Dietary fiber like oatmeal or oat bran will lower it about 5%. Vitamin E, maybe 10 to 20%. Goo goo lipid, which is a herb from India, lowers cholesterol and triglycerides 21% in three to eight weeks. Yeah, it works very effectively. And there's also activated charcoal, which works like a drug called Questran. Uh, cholestopol is another one. And what it does is it binds cholesterol in the gut and lowers the cholesterol in that manner. I sometimes use niacin also, but you have to be very careful with niacin because it can be quite toxic, particularly if it's in the form of time-release niacin. Half the people who take time-release niacin develop a chemical hepatitis. So I always prescribe immediate-release niacin and do it with some caution because there are lots of side effects like flushing, may increase blood sugar levels. But again, it's a highly effective drug that will help people tremendously. We also lower blood pressures very effectively in our patients. And um, our results show that in a matter of just a few days, these results are from day one to day 11, and the blood pressure drops from 132 over 80 down to 125 over 75. That's a 7 over 5 millimeter drop in blood pressure. And what you don't see here, but I need to tell you, is that usually on the first day of the program, I stop all the patient's blood pressure medications. The reasons I don't is if they're on just bags full of pills, then I'll cut them in half, or if they're frightened and they feel like that's too drastic, or if they're on beta blockers. That class of medications I cut down slowly, say every three to five days, I'll reduce the dose in half. But still, stopping the medications, we get a 7 over 5 millimeter drop in blood pressure. Now remember, the sicker you are, the happier I am. So let's take a look at people with really bad blood pressure. Say 171 over 101, that's the average. Anybody with a blood pressure of 150 over 90 or greater, we're looking at here. And they started 171 over 101, and in just a matter of a few days. This is looking at 11 days, but most of it takes place in uh, 48 to 72 hours. They drop to a blood pressure of 148 over 87, or a 23 over 14 millimeter drop in blood pressure. And again, most of these people have discontinued their blood pressure lowering medications. Now, how can something work that effectively? Well, it has to do with the fact that we make great changes to these people. And big changes get big results. For one thing, we decrease the pump activity. And the way we decrease the pump activity is by taking people out of their stressful environment, and I take their coffee away from them. Coffee is a very strong presser, and people don't realize it. Coffee will raise blood pressure dramatically. In fact, some people that are on blood pressure lowering medications, it's only because they're on caffeinated beverages. Even tea will bother many people. So I take them off that. It decreases the pump activity of the heart, lowers the blood pressure. The second thing I do is I decrease the sodium and increase the potassium in their diet by feeding them more vegetables, less salt, so that decreases the blood volume. And the third thing I do is I decrease peripheral resistance. Now, peripheral resistance, to understand peripheral resistance, imagine we're gardening and we're watering flowers here and we decide to water flowers 20 feet away. Well, we, we increase the resistance to flow by sticking our thumb over the end of the hose and the pressure squirts up as it increases. 
Well, high blood pressure in most people in our society is due to the fact that all the little hoses are being squeezed. They're being squeezed by atherosclerosis that makes blockages and makes the arteries stiff, inelastic. They're being squeezed by, by spasms that occur in the arterioles that are caused by the foods that we eat, and also bad cholesterol causes that too. And they're being squeezed by a sludging phenomenon that occurs. To show you how the sludging phenomenon works, let's take a look at the picture of a white of a person's eye. These experiments were done on relatively healthy men. Some of them had heart disease, some were perfectly healthy. And what they did is they took a picture of the white of the eye, the conjunctiva, and then they fed the person a high-fat meal. The frame on your left shows the white of the eye before any meal. You see lots of circulation, thick blood vessels, good flow, good perfusion to the tissues. And then the person is fed, in this case a 44-year-old fireman, is fed one meal that consists of 67% fat. That's like a meal I used to eat. In this case, two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, and two pats of butter. That was my typical meal when I was a young man. Well, he had it one time. And then they took a picture of the same area of the eye four hours later. And what you see is a dramatic reduction in the circulation. Blood vessels that appear in the first frame are gone. Why? Because vessel walls are transparent. And when no blood cells are flowing through, these opaque blood cells stop flowing through. Then you can't see the vessel wall. And so they disappear. Now, this takes place through the entire body. And you may understand how this occurs if you think back at some of the experiences you've had. For example, when I was going to school and eating the rich American diet, I learned very quickly that if I ate lunch, that I didn't do as well on tests or in meetings in the afternoon. So I just skipped lunch. Many people have had the experience where they go to a party. Everybody's having a good time, lots of fun, playing music, talking. They eat dinner, and they get sleepy and sluggish and go home. Yeah. We've known... We've known for 100 years that people who have narrowed heart arteries, they get chest pain after they eat. Now, doctors are still taught today that's because blood goes to the gut for digestion. That's not true. Peter Quo, in the 1950s from the University of Pennsylvania, proved that wrong in that they failed to teach it. He took people with narrowed heart arteries. He fed them a high-fat meal. They developed chest pain. He fed them the next meal with low-fat, same volume, same number of calories, and they didn't, they didn't develop a single episode of chest pain. There have been multiple studies where you take people with narrowed heart arteries and you feed them a low-fat diet and their chest pain goes away. Isn't that neat since the indication for angioplasty is chest pain and for almost all bypass surgeries is chest pain? So you take your heart patients, you feed them a healthy diet, the chest pain goes away, and by no coincidence, this is the same diet that reverses the underlying artery disease, the atherosclerosis. Now let me show you a dramatic representation of what occurs here. Now here you have the blood cells. They flow very easily, very smoothly. The blood cells in this, at this stage are very flexible. In fact, they'll bend in half and fit through a capillary half the size of a single cell. Uh, this is in a bigger vessel, so you see a lot more flow. Now you feed the fat. This could be fish fat pig fat, olive fat, doesn't matter what kind of fat. Now the blood cells become coated, and they no longer bounce off each other and repel each other. Instead, they stick together and form clumps. This is what we call rouleau formation. Some of the cells there have turned white. We call those ghost cells. The reason they turn white is because they've been so long away from the lungs. If you measure the oxygen content in people pre and post meal, you'll see a 20% drop in oxygen content. This uh, sludging phenomena continues for about 10 to 12 hours, and then it starts to break up. In my case, when I was growing up, I kept my blood sludged all day long. And the consequence is I was very lethargic, and I was very much affected by the meals that I ate. So when you change your diet, what happens is your circulation improves, and you immediately start to feel better. If you have narrowed heart arteries, the chest pain decreases or completely goes away. If you're having problems with thinking because of poor circulation, that improves. If you have trouble with your legs because of blocked arteries, you can walk longer and with less pain. Everything about you improves when you have better circulation. It's such a simple thing to do. And the same diet that improves the circulation, again, reverses the underlying atherosclerosis or artery disease. Goal number three is to avoid deterioration. And the most deteriorating disease I know is diabetes. People fall apart with this disease. They go blind. They have heart attacks, more osteoporosis, 
They have kidney failure. It's a terrible situation. Now, not all diabetics can you get better, but some of you can, those who have type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetics will continue to require insulin. But all diabetics, whether they're type 1 or type 2, childhood or adult type, will be benefited greatly by following a good diet because you feed them good foods and they have much less risk of any heart attacks, kidney failure, or other problems associated with their disease because you take such good care of them. There is an island 5,500 miles southwest of California. And on this island live Polynesian people. They're from Nauru, who enjoyed excellent health at the beginning of the last century. They had no diabetes or obesity or high blood pressure. And they lived on a diet of taro and potatoes and breadfruit and a little bit of fish. And then what happened is in the last century, the beginning of the last century, they discovered a natural resource on the island. It was bird dung. And they took the bird dung and they exported it to the rest of the world for its phosphates and nitrates, and they became known, what is known as the richest nation in the world. And so what they did is they decided to change their diet. So they abandoned this diet of mostly plant foods and imported their foods from Australia and New Zealand. And when you read about these people, like in this article from National Geographic in 1976, you find out that these people would often consume four different kinds of meat at a single meal, kind of like a submarine sandwich or one of those uh, colossal burgers. As a result of that kind of rich eating, they developed a population where back then, one-third of the individuals over the age of 15 had diabetes. Today, it's up to 40%. But you don't have to go that far to see this. You can look at the Pima Indians in the Tucson, Arizona. 50% of them have diabetes. You can look at the Hawaiians. About 30% of them have diabetes. People all over the world, particularly those that are less privileged people who eat rich foods with great enthusiasm, develop these high rates of disease, high rates of diabetes. If you'd like to develop diabetes, I'll show you how to do it. This work was done by Shirley Sweeney back in the 1920s. Shirley Sweeney took his medical students, who were always up for volunteering, and he did an experiment where he fed them either high-fat, high-carbohydrate, or high-protein diets. When he fed them high-fat diets for two days and did a glucose tolerance test, every one of them tested diabetic. Anything over 150 milligrams per deciliter of glucose is diabetes. So they all tested diabetic, which are the yellow lines. Then he took the same students and he fed them a high-carbohydrate diet. This diet was half starch and half sugar. And after that diet, he tested them and found that all of them tested normal. And so what good diabetic doctors knew back then and good diabetic should, doctors should know today is that fat paralyzes insulin activity. This is fish fat, corn fat, pig fat, cow fat. It doesn't make any difference. And causes it to work poorly. And carbohydrate, even pure white sugar, causes insulin to work better. Now, that isn't to make you think that sugar is health food. But I don't want you to get suckered into believing that sugar causes obesity or, or diabetes. It doesn't do it. But that's what we've always been focused on. Sugar is only one part of a rich diet. And if you, had to, if you had to pick on just one part of that rich diet that really burdened the body, I'd go for fat long before sugar. You know, if sugar was the problem, then you wouldn't see this scene. You wouldn't walk into a fast food restaurant and go through the line and see this great big person in front of you say, cheeseburger and a Diet Coke. Because the Diet Coke would have solved the problem, wouldn't it? Sure. That's a, a, mi a minor issue in the problem. The, all the rich food, particularly the burdens of the fats, get to them. Now, sugar is not health food. It's not for eating. But it shouldn't be focused on as the cause of diabetes and the causes of obesity because you'll never solve the problem if that's where your attention is solely directed. Getting older doesn't have to mean getting sicker. But, you know, that's what I used to think. When I was growing up, I used to think that it was natural to get fat and sick as you got older. But it's not supposed to be that way. It wasn't that way with my Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and Filipino patients that I took back care of back on the plantation when I was a beginning doctor. And that's not the kind of life that I want for myself or my patients. I want to go one decade to the next and feel great, function well, and enjoy my life. That's what people deserve, not to fall apart. And with the right information, that's what we can all have. Thank you very much.